the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman has made what is for him an unusual speech. But I must say to him that I think he's no more credible when he makes a, myster- when he makes a serious speech, a speech than when he wait- makes one that is more light-hearted. He certainly, he certainly mastered a veritable battery of statistics. Indeed, it seemed as if he made up for the absence of those statistics in every previous speech in history. But not one policy did he enunciate that would tackle unemployment at its root. That it would have reduced overmanning or would enable this nation to become more competitive, which we have to, that we're to get more jobs. Yes, he did indeed give a battery of statistics over the first two years. But has he forgotten his own two years when from March 1974, it took just over two years to be on the way to the IMF because his government hadn't the guts to follow the right policies to put things right themselves. Yes, he mentioned places like Linwood. I was a member of the government that sent the factory to Linwood with the best of intentions, with all of the possible regional aids. That factory which went to Linwood made a loss in 18 out of the 19 years of its existence. And I say to him in all honesty, that could not possibly go on. He referred to the tragedy at Consett and Corby. But he was a member of a government that put off steel closures that should have been dealt with years before. His government refused to face reality in the steel industry. He pointed out that his government sustained the number of people in jobs. Is he suggesting that steel would have a better future or that British Leyland would have a better future? If we put back all of those people who have been made redundant, they'd have had no possible future at all. Nor would productivity ever have, been, ever have risen. And indeed, all of the prospect of future jobs would have disappeared forever. He referred to world recession, said we didn't seem to know there was on when we came back into power. As a matter of fact, the world recession really started with a sharp increase in oil prices, and OPEC was actually sitting two world recessions, one in 74, and perhaps the right honourable gentleman will remember, sharp increase in oil prices followed by a very considerable reduction in the real oil prices for the greater part of the lifetime of his government. Another extremely sharp increase in oil prices which took place, which took place when OPEC was sitting when we were at the first economic summit in Tokyo. That was the beginning of the second world recession. That was the beginning of the second world recession. And oil prices since then have risen by over 100%. And the fact is, yes, there is a world recession. But the fact is, the fact is that the countries which were most efficient, the countries which had not got over Manning, The countries whose governments had faced realistically the economic problems before 1979, of course they ride the world recessions better. They are Germany, they are France, they are Japan. They are all the countries which which followed the very policies which the Right Honourable Gentleman's Government rejected and which we are now trying to to follow today. The Right Honourable Gentleman referred to the TUC policy document and to his own policies. They seem to amount to spend more, tax less, and meet the difference by printing and call it reflation. I must say to him that if anything like those proposals were adopted, the pound would plunge and inflation and interest rates would rocket. And it would be no use pretending that reimposing exchange controls would help, because look at 1976, there were exchange controls then, yet the pound plunged. And if the pound plunges with consequent increases in interest rates and inflationary expectations, bang will go all our hopes for more jobs. And that would be the effect of the Right Honourable Gentleman's policies. What he argued for was a policy of massive reflation.
I'm glad there is no doubt about what he's arguing for. A policy of massive reflation. Those who support him do so on the basis that there's a grave shortage of demand. In other words, they claim that there's a shortage of money in the economy. They argue that, as in the 1930s, the right way forward is to increase demand by a policy of reflation. But, Mr. Speaker, that analysis contains a simple and fundamental fallacy. There just isn't a shortage of demand at the present time. Well, look, for example, at the market for cars. Demand this year exists for 1.4 million cars. But fewer than 700,000 of those cars will be supplied by British workers. That's not a failure of the government to create demand. It's a failure of competitiveness in the factory to supply the goods. This year, Mr. Speaker, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has provided for an increase in the money supply of around 8%. This should translate into extra demand of some £15 billion. Now, in the 1930s, the situation was totally different. Prices were actually falling. There was indeed then a shortage of demand. But as a noble Lord, Lord Robbins, suggested in another place last Friday, a policy of reflation would have been right then but it would be quite wrong in the very different circumstances of today. An increase in the money supply of the amount which I've indicated can go either into real growth or it can go into price and pay increases. If there were no such increases, the growth in money supply that we are allowing for would permit 8% extra output. If pay and price increases were modest, there will still be room for some growth and for some new jobs. And our task must therefore be to divert the increase of money supply away from price and wage increases and into growth and more jobs. All the evidence of the last 20 years, all the evidence of the last 20 years suggests that to apply a dose of further general reflation now when the money supply is rising as it is, will be to create accelerating inflation, leading inevitably to still higher unemployment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between 1970 and 1980, expenditure in money terms grew by 340%, but only 16% of that went into output. And if we were to have a massive reflation now, more money would go not into rising growth, but into rising prices and ultimately into a falling number of jobs. So the Honourable Right Honourable Gentleman's call for reflation bears no relation whatever to the basic problem of the British economy, which he's always refused to face, which is lack of competitiveness. Governments cannot spend their way to prescribe targets for output and employment. At a time of inflation, that cannot work. By pumping more money in, he would stimulate inflation once again. And all the efforts that have been made over the past two years to bring about a new sense of realism would have been wasted. Our policies, Mr. Speaker, are addressed to the root causes of the uncompetitive economy we inherited in 1979. And the first step to a stronger economy is to get inflation down. Now, Mr. Speaker, this isn't just some minority doctrinal obsession pursued blindly for its own sake. It is a necessary precondition for our economic recovery. My right honourable friends and I have sometimes reminded honourable members opposite of the things they said about the importance of controlling inflation when they were in power. But I wonder how many of them realise the extent to which that belief is so widely shared today, both nationally and internationally, that it is those who think otherwise that are now a tiny minority obsessed with doctrinal delusions. No, 
let me remind honorable members, for instance, of this passage. We must continue to reduce inflation if we are to secure the higher investment and sustainable growth on which the durable recovery of employment depends. I couldn't have put it better myself. But that passage is the centerpiece of the communique issued at the conclusion of the Ottawa summit last week and was unanimously agreed, not just by those broadly conservative administrations, but also by those such as President Mitterrand and Chancellor Schmidt, who head broadly socialist ones. Inflation is the cause of unemployment, not an alternative to it. And in case there are any doubters on the other side of the House, let me remind honourable members of this passage too. Our most urgent task is to create more jobs while continuing to reduce inflation. Inflation does not reduce unemployment. On the contrary, it is one of its major causes. That, Mr Speaker, was an extract from the communique of the Downing Street Economic Summit in 1977, when unemployment of the, under the previous government was at its peak, after the Labour government had been rescued by the IMF. So the defeat of inflation is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for recovery. So we've taken further steps to lay the foundation for the growth of profitable enterprise. To remove long-standing obstacles, we've swept away controls and regulations on a large scale, including wage, price, dividend and exchange controls. To provide incentives and to help industry, we've lowered the basic rate of income tax from 33% to 30% and made even bigger reductions in the higher marginal rates, which had which had reached absurd levels under the previous government. And we've started to provide the small business sector with a more encouraging capital tax regime. And we've vastly improved the arrangements for stock relief. We've also introduced substantial incentives for new businesses, including in particular a business start-up scheme more generous and better than in any other country in the world. We've created a number of enterprise zones, the first three of which are already in operation, Swansea, Corby and Dudley. And five more will be in, the end of, uh, in operation by the end of August. There are calls for a program of investment-led growth but many forget the vast resources which the government is already providing as direct help to private sector industry, largely under the Industry Act and mostly in assisted areas. This year that will amount to over a billion pounds. And twice as much as that is being provided to public sector industries such as British Leyland and British Steel Corporation. This is not to enable them to carry on as they were but to help them carry out the necessary radical restructuring so that they too can eventually contribute to the recovery. Now all of those things are being done to lay the foundations for the future of private enterprise and indeed to make public enterprise profitable. In addition to reducing inflation as our top priority. We also believe that it's essential that as many young people as possible are giving training and practical experience in the use of the new technologies which will form the basis of so many new jobs. Over the last few months we've been discussing with industry ways in which such practical experience can be provided. We pioneered a scheme in Notting Hill for a technology centre providing computer and electronic training for young people. And I'm glad to be able to announce that following the success of that centre We've now approved a program with, as a first target, 20 information technology centres concentrated in our inner towns and cities where young unemployed people will be trained in computing and electronic assembly skills because that is where future genuine jobs lie. Mr Speaker, inflation has been checked and these measures are all now in place 
laying the foundation for the future prosperity of private and public enterprise. Of course they will take time fully to work through, but we are already seeing signs of success. And I propose to give some of them. The rates of increase of wholesale prices, retail prices, unit labour costs and of average earnings have all fallen substantially. In most cases, pay settlements have adjusted quickly to the ability of the employer to pay. The rate of increase in unemployment has been steadily declining over the past few months. On a seasonally adjusted basis, the July increase in unemployment was the smallest since December 1979, and vacancies notified in July rose for the first time in six months and showed the largest increase for over two years. Order books in many industries are filling up again. Orders received in the first quarter of this year by British Engineering Industries alone were worth nearly 25% more in real terms than those received in the last quarter of 1980. Notice, right, on, honourable and right honourable gentlemen opposite don't cheer. That is good news. There are many encouraging signs of substantially improved productivity in manufacturing industry. The Bank of England quarterly bulletin records a 2.5% improvement in productivity in the first quarter of this year compared with the first quarter of last year. And as the Right Honourable Gentleman is so devoted to the Financial Times, may I say that I was glad to see the industrial editor of that paper also describing the considerable gains in British productivity in an article last Friday. These productivity gains are not in just a few small and little no firms. They've also been achieved in our major vehicle industries, in steel, in engineering and in chemicals. Let me give a few examples. Plessy in Liverpool, almost doubling its sales per employee over three years and plans to more than double again by 1990. Thorny MI in Manchester, achieving productivity gains of at least 8%. Talbot in Coventry, a 40% improvement in productivity over the past two years. Neptune Glenfield in Kilmarnock, 30% increase in productivity. And a vice president of Ford Europe, referring to Britain, has said that middle management has switched from despair to enthusiasm to a degree that I cannot These are practical achievements in productivity which will bring prosperity to this country and, in fact, would not have taken place but for the policies being pursued by this government. Nor should we get improvements in our industry unless management once again was beginning to manage under the policies which we have pursued. We continue, I'm going to carry on, we continue to be a very successful trading nation. Our exports are worth some 33% of GDP, a higher proportion than in any other industrial country. A sustained and favourable balance in overseas trade has been maintained in chemicals, mechanical engineering and building materials, and outstanding export performances have been recorded by such diverse industries as mining machinery, industrial ends and war, in engines and wallpaper. I will give way to the right honourable to the honourable gentleman. If it is so marvellous, uh, and the Right Honourable Lady has referred to Liverpool, could she explain why we are continuing to have uh, wholesale redundancies, closure of factories, one of which I've been to see the Minister this morning, and can she explain why her policy is being so successful with the massive increase of unemployment in the Merseyside area in the last period. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman knows full well 
that those industries which have taken steps to put themselves in a competitive position yeah, yeah. are the industries which are our hope for more jobs for the future. Yeah, yeah. The ones which I am enumerating have, and I would have thought that the Honourable Gentleman would hope that more industries would do that. Yes, there will be some continued redundancies. That reflects years and years of overmanning which previous Labour governments refused to tackle. And unless they are tackled, there would be no hope for rising prosperity in this country. The last Labour government ducked it, we are tackling it, and therein lies hope for the future. But more than that, new enterprises are being, in, being formed. The Economist this week, the Economist this week confirms that entrepreneurs with marketable ideas are coming forward in large numbers and finding private sector finance to develop them. Only last month, the government introduced its own loan guarantee scheme to help small businesses. Already within a month, 180 loans have been guaranteed, many of them to new firms. On the question of investment, contrary to what is usually thought, the level of investment in plant and machinery, which is most closely connected to productivity, has shown a dramatic rise compared with 1975 and with 1978. In fact, the rise compared with 1975 is of the order of 30%. This is investment for the future, investment that will give increased productivity, investment that will enable Britain to compete. And we're also attracting major new foreign investment. For example, Hewlett Packard of California announced a few days ago they are planned for a second manufacturing base in the United Kingdom because we had, they said, now the best combination of financial, market and infrastructure provisions for their project. Large new investments in South Wales were recently announced by a Canadian telecommunication company and a Japanese television company. These are signs of success that are working through already. Of course, honourable members opposite don't like them. They are signs that the policy is working even in advance of an upturn in the world economy. And these are signs, this is the kind of output and production which will bring about the very expansion, the very increase in jobs, genuine jobs, which we on this side desire. Mr Speaker, governments alone don't make economic recoveries. Individuals and companies do. But what the government can do is to ensure that conditions are such that companies can take advantage of the expansion as it comes. We wouldn't have been able to do so unless this government had tackled problems at their root. And the examples I've quoted show the benefits of that approach are starting to come through. Now, the, the uh, opposition's motion refers to the government's social policies, and the right honourable gentleman referred briefly to the recent disturbance and to the social policies, and I intend to say a word about both in rather more detail than the right honourable gentleman referred to them. There are just two points I would like to make about the disturbances. First, many explanations have been offered about why they happened. Today is not the time to attempt a detailed analysis of the causes. We must await Lord Scarman's report. All I would say now is that the causes appear manifold and complex. The disturbances do not all seem to have had the same origins. It is, I think, worth pointing out, too, that disorders of this kind are not unique to Britain in Western Europe. They have occurred in recent weeks in Switzerland, Holland and West Berlin. Again, as far as one can judge, all for different reasons. The second point about the disturbances is what our immediate response should be. The government has been twofold. First, we've given full support to the police in their task of maintaining law and order. Second, faced with disturbances on this scale, it is plainly right for the government to take a fresh look at the problem of the inner cities and in particular to see whether the large sums of money already being spent on them are being used in the best way. And that's why my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for the Environment, is in Liverpool now. I believe that the public generally regards the government's balanced reaction of determination to maintain law and order and a readiness to look constructively at the underlying problems as the right response to the situation. 
The Right Honourable Gentleman referred to our social policies. Already, everyone is familiar with the priority we've given to law and order, and, as he mentioned it, to defence. But few realise that we have also singled out spending on the National Health Service as a major priority. As a major priority. We are now spending more in real terms on the National Health Service than in any year under the Labour government. More than in any year under Labour, 13.3 billion in, to be precise in 1981-82. Since March 1979, the health service has taken on a thousand more doctors and dentists and waiting lists have been cut by over a hundred thousand. Retirement pensions for a growing number of pensioners have had their value maintained in relation to prices at a cost of 4.4 billion more this year compared with 1978-79. No wonder the Right Honourable Gentleman didn't spend long on this in his speech. As for education, teacher-pupil ratios in our schools are now at a better level than they have ever been. No! will not like it because it proves that in spite of everything, in spite of the difficulties of world recession, we are doing better with those things than they were when they were in power. Yeah. And how they hate it. Yeah. Mr Speaker, these are only a few examples of the policies of this government, of ensuring the priority is given to looking after the elderly, the young and the sick, those least able to look after themselves. Mr Speaker, I've outlined the government's long-term strategy for solving our long-standing problems. Quite right, quite right. <laughs> but the Honourable Gentleman doesn't have to wait to hear it if he doesn't wish to do so quietly. But during the transition, we have to redouble our efforts to ease the burden of hardship caused by unemployment. Mr Speaker, we are already helping the unemployed by means of the present special employment measures. They currently help over 800,000 people at a cost of £1 billion this year. We intend to develop these programmes, not only to help people through a difficult time, but to do so wherever possible in a way which will provide lasting benefit to the economy. We must do this both for young people and for some of those who are older but who are without jobs. I will start by setting out our proposals to help young people. First, there is evidence from many areas of an increase in applications to stay on in school or college. It's good when young people choose to follow educational courses, many of a vocational nature, in many cases to obtain qualifications that will help them to get and keep jobs. An additional £60 million in 1982-83 will accordingly be provided for this purpose. As a result, we hope that as many as 50,000 more young people will stay on in school or college. Second, we are providing an extra £10 million this year and £11 million next for the support of longer-term skilled training of young people. This was announced last week. Third, we must continue to provide for those who leave school but fail to find work. I reaffirm the undertakings announced by my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Employment, last November, that all unemployed school leavers should this year be offered a place on the Youth Opportunities Programme by Christmas and that we should try this year to offer a place within three months to other young people who have been unemployed for three months. These objectives 
will require an extra 110,000 places on the Youth Opportunities Programme this year, above the 440,000 originally planned. My right honourable friend has informed the Manpower Services Commission today that the necessary resources for this will be provided. I will give the figures all at the end, both gross and net. I am aware that there have been criticisms of the Youth Opportunities Programme, not least from some of the young people who have taken part in it. Indeed, my right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, has already heard some of them from the young people of Liverpool. They felt that the work they were being asked to undertake was of a cosmetic nature, but as they po wanted positively to work for a business or to feel they were receiving effective training. Although I believe that in terms of the demands made upon it, the Youth Opportunities Programme has done a very good job indeed. We must now look at it more closely to see that the experience provided is satisfying to the youngsters themselves and that it gives the community which provides the resources the best possible value for money. We are therefore not only looking at the programme to see how it can be improved, but we are giving further consideration to the provision of a better training scheme for the young which would eventually replace the existing programme. Our aim is to reach the position where all young people on leaving school either move into further education, find a job, or are given the chance of vocational training or community service. We want to help the individual and to strengthen our economy by having a better trained workforce. A statement will of course be made when, after consultations, we've reached our conclusions. In the meantime, may I finish the end of this section? There's a lot more to come. In the meantime, I confirm that the existing guarantees under the Youth Opportunities Programme will be honoured next year as well as this, and that we shall continue to improve the quality of the programme. I give way to the Honourable But isn't, isn't the assurance which the Prime Minister has just given the same assurance which the Secretary of State has given on two previous yeah. occasions when he said that the position was deteriorating and that the government was earnestly looking at that moment at the very issue which she's now announcing. The consultations have been taking place over the last 18 months. All we needed was a decision and that is the decision which the cabinet has now funked. But we have not indeed had consultations over 18, 18 months. There was a, a document issued, a, a new training initiative. The Honourable Gentleman is correct in saying that we have given assurances that the guarantees would be honoured. We are in fact now finding the resources to ensure that they are honoured. And I must point out that those guarantees are very much better than were given by the previous Labour government. Yeah. Both in, both in those who have left school getting, getting some kind of work experience by Christmas and in those who have been out of a job for three months also having the chance to have some work experience. Fourth, the government believes that more needs to be done to help school leavers into jobs. Because the wages of young people are often too high in relation to those of experienced adults, employers can't afford to take them on even though it's clear that many employers would like to help. This situation has come about because of unrealistic pay bargaining over the years. It contrasts vividly with the situation in Germany, where the wages of young people are much lower relative to those of adults, and where, consequently, they have less youth unemployment. In future, if we are to get more jobs for young people, which is what the government wants, trade unions and employers will have to take this factor into account in their bargaining. The government, for its part, has decided to provide some encouragement to employers to take on more young people at realistic wage levels. We propose to introduce a new scheme under which employers will be offered a weekly payment of £15 for all young employees under the age of 18, provided they are in their first year of work and provided their earnings are below £40 per week. Full details of the scheme will be announced shortly with a view to its introduction early in 1982. It is expected to cost about £60 million in a full year. 
I now turn to the job release scheme. Exceptionally large numbers of people will be reaching normal retirement age in the mid-1980s. By bringing forward that peak of retirements, we can release jobs so that they may be taken by people who are at present unemployed. Our fifth proposal, therefore, is to lower the age for the job release scheme until March 1984, from 64 to 63 this November, <laughs> and to 62 from February next year. This will cost about £150 million in a full year. Sixth, as my right honourable friend the Secretary of State for Social Services announced last week, those aged 60 and over who are unemployed and have been drawing supplementary benefit for a year or more, will from November be able to retire on the higher long-term rate of supplementary benefit. This will cost about £20 million in a full year. Finally, I believe that we should immediately develop further opportunities for voluntary service for unemployed people of all ages. Our seventh proposal, therefore, is that the Government will provide additional funds for this purpose. We will provide a further £4 million for the remainder of this year and £8 million in 1982-83 for voluntary work in connection with the Community Enterprise Programme. There are also opportunities in social service and health where community support for the handicapped and elderly depends on a wide range of voluntary services as well as statutory provision. An additional £4 million will accordingly be available in 1982-83 to expand these activities and the departments concerned will be considering how best to apply this money. Mr Speaker, the additional costs of meeting the existing undertakings under the Youth Opportunities Programme are estimated to amount for the rest of 1981-82 to about £90 million. They may approach £350 to £400 million in 1982-83, but that will depend, among other things, on the impact of the new scheme to encourage employers to take on more young people and of the increased educational expenditure, both of which could lower the costs of the Youth Opportunities Programme. The costs of the other measures are estimated at about £60 million in 1981-82, and at around £320 million in 1982-83. For 1981-82, the extra expenditure will be met from the contingency reserve within the planned total for public expenditure. For 1982-83, it will be taken into account in the forthcoming review of public expenditure. The figures I have mentioned, the figures I have mentioned are gross costs which will partly be offset by lower expenditure on social security benefits and higher tax receipts and by support from the European Social Fund. The total net cost of fulfilling the Youth Opportunities Programme undertakings and of the other measures may be of the order of £400 to £500 million in 1982-83. These extra costs will have to be accommodated within the general framework of the government's medium-term financial strategy. Mr Speaker, we all feel concern for those who are unemployed, but concern is not enough. Nor is it enough to find means of relieving the effects... If the Right Honourable Lady has reached the end of the package, could I put this to her? Whilst, of course, we welcome any U-turns that are involved in this package. Some of, us, uh, some of us remember the fierce debates we had in the House when the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, was attacking the job release scheme and raising the age limit to the 64. And we can remember those. And we can remember several of the other debates. So some of the, some of the proposals represent a U-turn by the government and we can congratulate the government upon yeah, them. Yeah. But when the Right Honourable Lady says that these questions are subject to consultation, 
Will she agree that those consultations will involve full consultations with the Manpower Services Commission because many of us will regard this package as a derisory package to deal with such a major problem? With regard to the first point that the Right Honourable Gentleman made, the Right Honourable Gentleman brought down, I speak from recollection, the age for the job release scheme down to, to 62 for one month before the general election. <laughs> Not therefore in a position to speak about it. One month. One month. With regard to the Manpower Services Commission, the Youth Opportunities Programme is, of course, run by the Manpower Services Commission. Any changes made within it will, of course, be the subject of consultation with the Manpower Services Commission, and I believe that I made that clear. Since we regard this programme and that the packet that the Right Honourable Lady has presented as quite insufficient. What I'm asking is whether those consultations with the Manpower Services Commission, which really does know something about the problem, whether those consultations may involve an increase in the amounts that are to be supplied instead of sticking rigidly to these figures which we think are quite insufficient to deal with the problem. I do not think that the Right Honourable Gentleman knows very much about the Youth Opportunities Programme. The guarantees which I have given... Well, doesn't mean to say he knows anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the guarantees that have been given, the guarantees that have been given are that school leavers who have not found a job will in fact be offered some kind of work experience by Christmas, which is a jolly sight better than what the Right Honourable Gentleman offered them. And if they've been out of work, if, if uh, they've been out of work for three months, they will also be offered a place on the Youth Opportunities Programme. It is to honour that commitment which we are saying that the youth opportunities places will need to be increased and we've made the resources available to increase them by 110,000. The guarantees will persist not only for this year but also for next year as I made perfectly clear had he listened to what I said. Mr Speaker, we all feel concern for those who are unemployed but concern is not enough. Nor is it enough to find means of relieving the effects on individuals of our failure as a nation to compete, although we shall certainly do our part. I have no doubt that the party opposite could also put forward ways similar to the measures which I have proposed today. But the difference between us is this, and it is profound. We believe that long-standing problems need long-term solutions. We believe there is no shortcut to full employment. The route lies through becoming competitive again. The party opposite believe there is a shortcut, and that it, that it is called reflation. That, Mr Speaker, is a road that would take us away from becoming competitive and away from more jobs, would take us towards hyperinflation and towards higher unemployment, and it is a road that we will not follow. We must recognise that we cannot enjoy more wealth until we earn it. This government is committed to saying that we do earn it. It will be hard work and it will take time, but with our policies we can do it. I urge the House to reject the soft options, to reject the prospect of continuing economic decline, to reject reflation and to reject this motion and to support Her Majesty.